Um, is going to help us in our lives, walking and principles about God. But that's beautiful because what brings purpose is meaning is other people. Other purpose is other person focused. It's not about us. And I have clients that come, young people who have no purpose in their lives. They're just going through the motions and they're empty. You know, when I talk about purpose, they get very, very um, happy and you know interested in that so praise God because if we can do anything for others then our living will not be in vain praise you Lord for this word that you've given me a simple word God but an impacting word Lord anointed God I pray may we hear your words not mine your word your logos word your rhema word God that we would be attentive by the spirit and we would pick up what you want us to get out of this, Lord. What you want us to do differently. And how you want us to live our lives, Father. Glorify your name. Magnify your name, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. The Charisma Magazine in 2017 showed how Matt Lockett left a prosperous 12-year marketing and advertising career. Sold his home and most of his belongings in a garage sale. <clears throat> Excuse me. And moved his family to D.C. to join the House of Justice, to start the House of Justice of Prayer. I think he joined it. And he served as executive director since 2008. That ministry is doing incredible kingdom work. He's contending for prayer at the Capitol. I'd say that's pretty important, don't you? Pretty important. So God was pushing man out of his comfort zone for his priorities. Because purpose is not about us. It's all about God. It's all about what he wants to do in the earth. It's never about us. I think we have a really hard time getting that because in the culture we live in, it's all about us. It's all about God making me happy, blessing me, keeping me, fixing me, and all that. So, you know, I'm sure he reasoned in his mind and rationalized, you know, this is crazy. I've got a really good job. I'm making good money, and God wants me to move. But he didn't allow his flesh to dominate. And the now, final analysis, he chose to do what God said. To obey is better than sacrifice. And that's what we see in the book of Jonah, as I share about the prophet Jonah tonight and what he actually did. It's a short book, very short, but it's very fascinating when you read it. Um, and Jonah's name means dove. He was called as a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of King Jeroboam II. Jonah's story is unlikely start of a great awakening in the country of Nineveh, you know, Nineveh, which was in Assyria. But um, it's amazing how God did a mighty miracle there and saved 120,000 people. It was a major city in, uh, of the Assyrians, but the people were very cruel and warlike, pagan and ungodly. They did not know anything about Jehovah God. All they knew was their idols and their people. They knew nothing. So the prophets of Hosea and Amos had declared that Jehovah would use Assyria as an instrument of uh, punishment against his people. So we can only imagine the alarm that Jonah felt when God called him to go to Nineveh. Because he's thinking in his mind, like we do, rationalizing, how could God want me to go to Nineveh and preach a message of repentance when that's our enemy? They're going to kill us. They want to kill us. So he uh, reasoned in his mind, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittal, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up to me. And this is a very significant point. I'm going to make the major points clear to you tonight. This is one of them. You see, God was grieved at the abominable sins in the city of Nineveh. Now, true, it's true God was very focused as we read the Bible on Israel. That was his chosen people, and they were his, you know, and they still are. So, but he was very aware of the terrible sin in this immoral city and how brutal they were. See, they were Gentiles who had no regard for God. They worshiped their own idols. However, even though they're a foreign country to Israel, God said they're accountable to me. You see, all over the world, the nations are accountable to God. ISIS, Iran, uh, Iraq, all these nations, Turkey, they're all accountable to God. Because Romans 1.18 says God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness. Since what can be known about God is evident be among them because God has shown it to them through the creation of the world. In other words, there's no excuse. Even though they were heathen, he had shown them through creation. And this is what we tell people when they say, well, how do they know? Well, we do send people to preach the gospel. But God says they'll know anyway. 
through creation, even if no one preached the gospel. So you see, God was grieved, very grieved at this nation, you know, and he was grieved at the terrible sin that was in it. But we need to keep repenting for the sins of our nation, see, because we are sinning. We have sinned terribly. You know, when we have to protest against abortion, when we have to have people protest and want to kill Supreme Court justices because they're fighting to kill their babies, that's pretty bad. I don't know how God stands it. I'm glad I'm not God because I wouldn't be able to deal with that. See, but he's so merciful. He deals with that. We have a nation that's very evil. We're living among a lot of corruption and evil in this nation. And I know you've gotten used to it, but please hear me tonight. God is not used to it. Amen. He wants us to repent. He wants us to be on our face, and he wants us to see what's going on in this nation and repent of the evil because he's very aware of the evil. And I'll tell you, it's only the mercy of God he hasn't done something drastic in this nation because we know better. Amen. We know the word. We know the word. I know not a lot of people say what I'm saying, but that's what we need from the pulpits of America. We need pastors and leaders to rise up and say, look, this is what's going on in this nation, and we have to repent. But Jonah ran away from the call of God. Where can I go from your spirit, the Bible says? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. For we cannot run from God. But he tried, and he ran headed for Tar Tarshish, a city in southwest Spain. Now Nineveh, that was the opposite direction of Nineveh, Tarshish. Nineveh was already 500 miles from Israel, so he was running in the other way. So he didn't want to do what God called him to do. And sometimes we don't either, right, if we're really honest. We can be really fleshy, and we can say, well, you know, I know God may want that, but I don't want to do that. So uh, a few weeks ago, I was in my prayer time, as I am every morning, and the Lord said, I want you to do a 40-day fast, a 40-day partial fast. Well, I already fast regularly, but this was more. And I didn't really want to do it. And I thought, are you sure, God? I mean, is this really God or is this me? Am I just thinking I should do this? And then I said, Norma, come on. You're not going to come up with a 40-day fast. You're not going to want to do that. So it has to be God, see. And I just finished that up yesterday. And I thank God, even though I felt a lot of warfare during that time, too, that I was obedient. But it's very easy to rationalize away what God is telling us to do. Believe me, we've all done it at some time in our lives, you know. And that's what he did. He rationalized that, wait a minute, these people are the enemy of Israel. I'm not going over there and preach a message of, uh, come on, you're going to be destroyed. I'm not doing it, he said. He was more self-focused than he was God-focused. That's another important point in this message. Are we more self-focused than we are God-focused? How are we seeking him? How much, how much is God a priority? See, we're, it's very easy in our culture just to get all about our lives. Fewer and fewer people are attending church. They're not, they don't want to be in the house of God. They don't have time. Even though we're in the worst time ever. Has anyone seen a worse time in their life than now in America? I have not. So this is when we should wake up. But unfortunately, the church is not waking up. So Jonah reasoned in his mind. I love what Watchman Nee says about reasoning. And this was a stronghold in my life that I had to overcome. Because I would reason things and reason things. And God was, has asked me to do some crazy things that didn't make sense in the natural. But Rajman Nee says, it's very true that we need to have the eyes of our reason put in order to follow the Lord. What governs our lives, is it reason or authority? Is it reason or God's word? When God commands us, do we stop and consider the matter? Is there a sufficient reason to do it? Or do we just go ahead and obey God? And maybe you need to seek godly counsel, but we should be obeying God. So there are consequences to what Jonah did. And there's always going to be consequences to sin and when we walk away from God. You know, God will forgive you. And none of us are perfect, I'm sure not. But when we deliberately walk away from what we know God wants us to do, there are consequences. Even though he forgives you, there will still be consequences for that sin, you see. And there were severe consequences because be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm that the ship threatened to break up. He went on a ship and he wanted to, you know, he was on his way to Tar Tarish and he wanted to escape, you know. And uh, God sent the great wind. What did Jonah lose by his disobedience? He lost the presence and protection of God. He lost all peace of mind. 
He lost because time, he had to go to Nineveh. That was time took, taken away from going to Nineveh. So what happened on this ship, as you know, you probably know the story, the crew was very afraid, and they knew he was, you know, served Jehovah God. So they said, what's going on with you? And he owned it and said, look, I'm, I'm the problem. I'm the cause here. So throw me overboard. But they didn't want to. But then when they saw how bad it was, they threw him overboard. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love, Jesus said. If you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. But if you just live it to yourself, you're not going to. You're just going to have emptiness. So we choose to lay down our lives. See, that's a principle of God's. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm, just like that. He was the problem because he was disobedient. Seems like a wild story, doesn't it? However, it is true. I'll, I'll be able to tell you that in a minute. But the Lord had prepared and appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord had prepared and appointed this fish because the Lord goes before us to prepare us for what's ahead. He goes before us to make the crooked places straight. So God was doing something to humble him and to spare his life, but Jonah didn't know that. So what did Jonah do? He spent three days and three nights in the bell, belly of this great fish. Now the Bible doesn't say it's a whale, as possibly it could have been, but it says a great fish, you know. Um, there's a lot of conjecturing around that, but I don't think it's very important. However, many believe this story is preposterous because it's just really out there, isn't it? I mean, really, when you think about it, I mean, you know, it's very few people, and even pastors and leaders, that have a biblical worldview. Only four out of ten have a biblical worldview. So when you're looking at this, you're thinking, well, that's crazy. I'm, I don't believe that. A lot of uh, kids go into Bible college and, and theological schools don't. But Jesus himself said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. sign. But none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish in the heart of the earth, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment and with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. That's amazing. One greater than Jonah. Jonah was the foremost uh, Old Testament prophetic sign of Jesus being in the grave three days and, and uh, resurrecting after three days. And that was the story that Jesus himself validated. We need to hear that. That's another important point. Jesus himself validated this preposterous, outlandish story of Jonah. And it was a sign of his death and resurrection and being in the earth for three days and three nights. So we really have to pay attention to this. Because a lot of people don't believe the Bible. They think these are a lot of nice stories. But it's not true. This is a biblical truth that Jesus himself validated. He didn't have to validate that. There were many other things he could have validated from the Old Testament. Many he did. But he definitely did this. But Jonah was in desperation by now, right? So he cried out to God, You hurled me into the deep, deep, into the very heart of the seas. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you. But with a song of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What have I vowed I will make good? Salvation comes from the Lord. That's what Jonah said. So in this desperate place, Jonah realized God got his attention to me. He knows how to get our attention. He knows how to get us to the place where we really, you know, pay attention. And we must cry out to God, too, in this hour. We must cry out to God in our trials, which I do, believe me. And we have to persevere in faith. This is a time of persevering in faith right now. You know, many people were disappointed in the election. Some were not. But whatever, uh, God is in control. And we look to him and we persevere in faith for whatever God has purposed for this nation. But it's a time to rise up and let our voices be heard, you know. So God heard Jonah's cries and he commanded the great fish to vomit Jonah out on dry ground, which he did. Then the Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him sincerely and in truth, he also will hear their cry and save them. Our Abba Father always hears our cries, and we need to realize that. We need to believe that when we don't feel like it. Sometimes, do you ever not feel like God is hearing your prayers? I do. I feel like what I'm talking to the wall here. You know, sometimes we feel like that. But the Word said God hears our cries. He knows our cries. So God's miraculous power in the book of Jonah 
is shown, shown by God sent a great storm. He directed the men to implicate Jonah. He calmed the sea. He arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah. And he kept him alive in the fish. That's pretty miraculous right there. To keep Jonah alive in this fish was a miracle. And he caused the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land. And then he said a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it a message I give you, Jonah. This time, Jonah obeyed God because obedience is better than sacrifice. And boy, do we need that truth these days. You know, God wants our obedience. And obedience is a sign of our love for God. It's not hard to obey God if we love him because we want to please him and honor him, see. And the very first day, here's what he proclaimed. Forty more days and none of them will be demolished. I don't think, the Bible does not say there was a mention of mercy. Now he may have said that, but it was not recorded in the Bible. He didn't say, repent, repent, uh, and God will have mercy on you and spare you. He said, in 40 days, none of them will be overturned, and a lot of versions say demolished. Demolished. Well, demolished is a pretty strong word, right? So it was a negative brief message, but many times 40 is very significant in the Bible. And for, it was 40 days that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus fasted. God calls for fasting sometimes for 40 days. 40 years are in the Bible. The word says the people of Nineveh believed God. That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing that they believed God. Now, some commentaries say they may have believed God, uh, God or uh, Jonah, I mean, because the story got back to them about Jonah being in the whale or in the great fish. So it's possible that it did. A story like that probably very much could have gotten back to them and put the fear of God in them. But, but let me say this. We have just finished reading Isaiah, Jeremiah, almost done Ezekiel in our Bible reading for the year. And God is speaking over and over and warning his people to repent from their sins. Amen. It's blatant. He warns them. Uh, unbelievable warnings to turn from their idols, tell them what's going to happen. Again and again he tells them, tell my people. I will repent, and I will have great mercy upon them. Do they repent? No, they do not repent. They are obstinate, and they do not repent. So this is a time, again, for this nation to repent. To repent, because God could bring great sorrow on this nation. You know, it's also a time to treat Israel good. And he, we know that if we bless Israel, we will be blessed. And sometimes some of our legislators are not blessing Israel. They're causing other things to happen. So the other thing is they believed, and they acted on what they believed. Because the decree was proclaimed by the king and his nobles, do not any man or beast or herd or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. They were known to be people of violence, very violent people. So who knows, God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger, the king said, so that we will not perish, Jonah 3, 6 to 9. That's what he said. So my question is, are we acting on what we believe? Are we truly acting on God's commands? Are we sowing into people's life, like Ivy's song said? Are we bearing fruit? Are we showing love? Are we telling the gospel story? There are people going to hell every day. Since we met three weeks ago, several people I know had sudden deaths. One 19-year-old girl was killed suddenly. Her father was killed suddenly in his late 40s, early 50s. Other, uh, a friend of mine in New York, her husband died of a heart attack uh, and complications after a week. So people die all the time who do not expect to die. So are you ready? Are you ready? Anyone listening to my voice to face eternity? See, God, they acted on what they believe. Are we acting on what we believe? Are we acting? And again, the prophet Jeremiah said, perhaps they will listen and return. Do not hold back a word, God said to Jeremiah, for perhaps the Israelites will listen and return, each from his evil and way of life, so that I might resent concerning the disaster that I plan to do them to them because of the evil of their deeds. That's what Jeremiah said. And in Jeremiah 18, 8, God declares, At one moment, I am at announce concerning a nation or kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. However, if that nation I have made an announcement about turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the disaster I have planned to do with it. Isn't that powerful? God is so, that's the other point I want you to get. 
There's several things I've already said, you know, about the God, Jesus validating the story about obedience is better than sacrifice. And the mercy of God is and blatantly demonstrated in the story of Jonah. Great mercy over this wicked nation that had no regard for God at all. But when they proclaimed a fast and they really repented before God, you see God knows our hearts. Amen. He knows if we're sincere or not. And he knew those people were sincere. So this is what they did. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth as a sign of mourning. The king sent in ashes showing his deep humiliation. And human and animals were required to fast. Very interesting. Decree that all men should turn from their evil and balance. So this is what God did then. And this is what God will do now for any nation that proclaims and turns from their evil way. But where is our outcry for the sin of our nation? I don't hear people proclaiming, you need to repent. There's a few people across the nation. There's a few of us, but there aren't enough people saying, it's a time to repent. It's a time. There was a wake-up call with COVID. That was a wake-up call for the body of Christ. And now we're past a lot of that. But now there's even more evil. There's more evil, blatant evil corruption all over this country. And we're still not calling out for repentance, that we need to repent and fast and pray and seek God. You know, so... Just as God spoke in Joel, therefore also now says the Lord, turn and keep on coming to me with all your heart, with fasting, which people don't want to do, with weeping and with mourning until every hindrance is moved and the broken fellowship is restored. Rend your hearts and not your garments and return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And he revokes his sentence of evil when conditions are met. Isn't that powerful? He is loving and compassionate. This is Joel 2, 12 and 13. And he revokes his sentence of evil when conditions are met. So God had great compassion. He saw their actions and they turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do them. And he did not do it. Isn't that powerful? He relented. He changed his mind. Changed his mind. You see, the God who never changes himself. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. May really change what he fully intends to do if the people change what they've been doing. And our hearts are changed. And we, we do you pray? I pray, Lord, every day. Search my heart. See if there's any wicked way, any attitude, word, or deed. Something I need to see, I am not seeing. Because we're really good at rationalizing our sin. But ask God every day. Ask him to show us something. So God will change his mind about what he might do to destroy a nation or to bring judgment on a certain place, you know, if we cry out to God. But after so much time, God does pour out his wrath and anger after so much judging. Uh, but repentance gets God's attention. That's another important point. Repentance gets God's attention. And it got God's attention when this evil, warlike culture of people Repented, it got God's attention. He doesn't hold grudges. He readily forgives. Uh, and the word, um, the Hebrew word, hapkak, is the word for um, demolish, but it has a second meaning. The second meaning is changed. So Nineveh, instead of being demolished, was actually changed. Isn't that awesome? Because God saw their hearts. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has been merciful. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. That's another great point. Mercy, God's mercy beyond any, we cannot fathom God's mercy. We just can't because we aren't that merciful. I mean, we really can't as humans, but he's so merciful. For he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the mercy and loving kindness toward those who worshiply and fearly worship him. But God loves the perpetrators. Sometimes when we look at people, the murderers, the sexual predators, those who promote sex trade and use children, it's hard for us, isn't it? You know, we just, oh, we can't stand it. But guess what? God loves these perpetrators just like he loves you and me. He loves them too. And he's not willing any would perish. That's why he sent his son to the world, that he loved the world so much he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So all you have to do to receive Jesus is call out to Jesus, receive him as the son of God, and ask him to forgive your sin. He was demonstrating to Israel 
he would repent. You see, this is a very significant story because God was trying to get through to Israel. I mean, the Lord knows he used prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these prophets. I mean, the things God asked Jeremiah to do were crazy, you know. If you haven't read the book of Jeremiah, you need to read it. It's a powerful book. It tells you what God is like. This is why you need to read the whole Bible. Because you can't just, I love the, the Psalms and Proverbs and the New Testament. But guess what? I'm going to miss a lot of what God's like if I don't read the other part of it, you know. And the thing that stood out to me was how God was so merciful. God merciful. And see, God sparing Nineveh, a Gentile nation, and the jaws of destruction on this incredible show of repentance shows that Israel experiencing doom was not because God was not willing to forgive them, but because they were obstinate and would not repent. And God, look at this country over here, Israel. I've forgiven them. I did not destroy them. Do you pay attention? Look it up. You know, that's what he's saying. You know, he was teaching them how inexcusable their, uh, and, and pent, they weren't repenting and how inevitable their run would be if they persevere in their sins. I mean, I mean, he told them, you know, you will be eating your children. There'll be terrible famine. I'm going to destroy the town. I'm going to destroy all of this. Read it for yourself. This is a God who pours out wrath after so much time, brothers and sisters. But we are in mercy. We are in the mercy of umbrella of mercy and grace. So now is the hour of salvation. Now is the time to get to God. Now is the time to repent for our nation. Repent for yourself and repent for our nation. We need to repent for our nation. Our nation is, if God does not judge this nation, Billy Graham said he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I believe that. Because when Billy Graham said that, huh, it's a hundred times worse now than when he said that. So you can imagine how God feels right now. We need to be repenting. Then God was trying to show Israel. This is a very important point. I relented and did not hurt these people. I did not bring wrath upon them because they repented. Now pay attention, Israel. But they did not pay attention. And that is so sad. They love their sin more. So he who conceals his sin does not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces it finds mercy. Although God did, did spare none of it then, 150 years later, the nation fell to the Babylonians in 1612, which was prophesied by the prophet Nahum because of their great sin. They went back to sin. You see, after one generation, then another generation, the generations go, and now we have generations, our younger people who hardly know God, who don't even go to church, you know, uh, and that's very sad. So what was Jonah's uh, response real quick here? His response was he was greatly displeased and became angry. I'd say he was in the flesh, don't you? <laughs> oh, Lord, this is not what I said when I was still home. Isn't this what I said? This is why I was so quick to flee to tarnish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. At least you knew that about God. Slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents for sending calamity. But why was he angry? Because I think his ego was on the line. It's hard to say for sure. He was frustrated because he had preached judgment, and judgment didn't happen. He should have been happy and rejoicing that it didn't happen. But instead, he was angry, you know. So he wanted to, God to judge Nineveh. And this illustrates sometimes how fleshy we can be, that we tend to be more self-focused than God-focused. And Jonah was very self-focused. It was about him going there, preaching this word, and then he wanted God to do it, what he said. And he didn't do it. So he was angry. Who is he to be angry with God? And what, what marvels me, how can you spend three days in the belly of a well, a great fish, and come out so arrogant? How can you come out so arrogant? So it's amazing, you know. Uh, so that's what he did. He was very angry, and God's purpose. And God said to him, "Should I not be, should I not be caring about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals, because they didn't know better? Really, these people were pagan. They hadn't been taught the word. They hadn't been taught about God. Should I not care about them? God said. He has power to perform his word. So God made Jonah willing to do his will. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry with me? And Jonah didn't answer him. He just walked away. He stonewalled God. And he went and he made a shelter. And, and um, he rejected it. And God was merciful because he helped him by having a palm crisp tree vine grow, which grows about 8 to 10 feet high. And one leaf can cover over your head to give you shelter. You know, because Jonah was kind of waiting to see what all was going to happen. He was angry, you know. But he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. 
So he's an example of a self-focused person who follows God, who doesn't really want to do what God said. But God used a vine, a worm, and an east wind to show John, Jonah his selfish concerns for his own physical welfare were much greater than his concern for the Ninevites. He wanted his comforts. And I'm wondering today, although there are many committed believers, such as those who are here tonight, and many others too across the nation, but there are many who are just on a warming church seat, not coming anymore. They're much more invested in their own lives and the good life and what God can do for them. Where's our burden for souls, people who are going to hell every day? If they have not received Jesus Christ, the Bible's very clear. They're going to a horrible place. And I wonder if we really believe that. People die, like I said, that don't expect to die. Are we God's light shining in darkness? Are we actually doing what Ivy said? You know, to be the light. Um, you know, are we running from God in any way? Do we want the Muslim we meet on the street to have a relationship with Jesus? Do we care that the sex predator comes to God? You know, are we doing our own thing? I know this is kind of a tough message in a way because it challenges us to search our hearts about what we're doing. And if we're putting God first, you know. Uh, God, Jonah pitied a plant which cost him no toil to rear, which is short-lived and valueless. How much more did God pity the 120,000 men and women in the great city of Nineveh? So we should marvel at God's grace. We should be in uh, regard, high regard and astonishment of his mercy over Nineveh and his mercy over this nation when we are so evil and do the things that we do. I mean, it just boggles my mind that we go to such great extremes to carry on in this nation because we want to kill babies. I mean, God have mercy. This is what they did in the Old Testament. They put their children in the fire and killed them. It's the same thing. It's worship of Baal. It's the same thing we're doing today, brothers and sisters. Wake up and see. We must repent for our nation. You know, we must repent. So the book shows why the destruction of Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire were delayed for God because he wanted to show great mercy to them and use it as an example to Israel. So what application when we get, and I've got a handout for you so you can read that, but what are some of the main things I've said? Repentance gets God's attention. To obey is better than sacrifice. We cannot run from God. That we can be very fleshy too and rationalize our sin. Maybe it's not a blatant sin like, you know, some of the things people do in the world, but it could be sins of omission or sins that you say something you shouldn't say or don't forgive somebody. You know, there's all kinds of things we can do. The Bible says we reap what we sow. That's a law of God's. It, it's not something that comes that we can change. That's a principle of God's that whatever you sow is what you reap, you know. That our God is so merciful. This is one of the main tenets of this book, of the book of Jonah, is the mercy of God. And a humble attitude shows dependency on God. That we trust his purposes even when we don't understand. We don't know what God's doing. He will show us the way. That being in ministry of any type is not a place to feed your ego. God have mercy and search us. It is not a place for egos. But instead, it's much more death to the flesh. And anyone who is sincerely ministering, hearing this here by my, my voice anywhere, then knows that ministers, it is definitely death to the flesh. God help us if you're on it for an ego trip. So also that Jesus validated this incredible story. He validated this story that seems so preposterous. And Jonah's prophetic, uh, what happened was a prophetic look what happened to Jonah at the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we need to search our hearts tonight and ask God, is anything I'm doing grieving you? Is there anything I'm not obeying in? Is there any way, am I repenting enough for my sin and the sin of this nation? Am I actually being a bright light? Or am I too taken up with my own life that I don't take time to be there for other people? Uh, so determined to radically abandon our lives to God for his purposes because God had a reason. He had a very significant purpose for Jonah, but Jonah ran away from it. He did come back and repent and do it, and then he had an attitude. So we're to run toward God and not from God. So remember, this was a sign to the people of Israel that if you repent and you are sorry for what you're doing and turn from your wicked way, not just repent, but turn from the sin, then I will have great mercy upon you and forgive you and spare you. And that's what we need to think about for our nation, that God wants to have mercy on us 
no matter how much the sin is in this nation. He wants to spare us of any terrible judgment because he loves us and he wants to have more and more people come to him. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that whatever it is that you want to speak to us through this word, you would do it by your spirit, Father. We thank you, God, that you are faithful as we repent, and we do repent for our nation, God. We ask you to forgive us for the terrible sins of this nation, God. Oh, God, convict people. Convict us of our sin. Turn us to turn away from any sin, anything that grieves or hurts you, and to turn our hearts toward you, God, that we'd be willing to be a bright light shining in the darkness, proclaiming your word, and be a vessel of honor. And I thank you for this. Praise and glory be to your name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.